of Edinburgh at the UK, where he's finalizing his PhD and doing research on how small water technologies shape urban water consumption in India. So we hope that we can read your work very soon. And with that introduction, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Amit Sang, Amit Tangshu, and welcome to IT. It's lovely to be at the mecca of water engineering knowledge in the world. It's uh, great to see such a very diverse audience and I've noticed that there are many of your practitioners, so we are kind of part of the same family as well. Uh, as you kind of heard from Michelle's introduction, is this too loud? No. Okay. Uh, and I really don't like the sound of my voice, to be very honest. It is not a uh, very Indian treat, actually. Um, <clears throat> The thing is that uh, I do wear many hats and uh, I hope for your sake I don't speak through them today. So, uh, who's water and who's knowledge? Before we get into this, I wanted to talk about a case study. And this case study sounds so good, it's almost like utopia. And we're talking about a city, a city which has a population of 4.5 million approximately. Let's say it generates 100 million litres of sewage and wastewater per day, 100 million plus. Interestingly, there are 3 to 4 sewage treatment plants in the city, but 80% of the sewage 
does not get treated there. It gets treated in 254 constructed wetlands, or call you as you, as you would, oxidation ponds, spread across 12,500 hectares of land, which are also by default fish farms. And it produces 10,000 metric tons of fish every year, which is resold back to the city, which is contributing and giving it the sewage as a form of nutrient recycling. 50,000 people earn their livelihood by maintaining this vast waterscape. And approximately, in Indian terms, 600... I gave away the, the, the crux of the presentation by giving away the currency. Uh, 100 million US dollars are saved annually by the municipality because they don't have to treat this wastewater, they don't have to go through the, the cost of managing sewage treatment plants. And 60% of the carbon that this the wastewater would have ideally emitted are sequ is sequestered in this in this uh, wetland system. Uh, any any responses to where do you think this exact city is? Which city am I talking about? Hazard a guess. There is there never there is never a wrong answer. So Nairobi, Kenya. <laughs> Good try. And I appreciate the answer. It's not correct. But it's a, it's it's close in a different way, and we'll come to that later. Any other guesses? Mumbai, India. You're getting very close. I yeah. Hyderabad, no. No, no, no. Now this is going into all the other metropolitan cities. I'll give the answer away. The answer is the city where I was born and raised, the city of Calcutta. And I introduce you to the, to the East Kolkata wetlands, a Ramsar site. And uh, if you were to look at any of the current discourse or current uh, uh, ideas around water management or sanitation management, you'd find a lot of that, you'll find traces of that here. If you'd like to understand the constructed wetlands, why not come and study these types of the wetlands? If you want to, want to understand circular economy, which is doing the rounds in the Netherlands nowadays, why not look at these types of the wetlands? And I can go on and on and rein a few more uh, acronyms uh, as if they have not been gained enough on us already but uh, in our practice so IUWMs, community-based natural resource management, DWOTs anyone? There we go. Convivial conservation, it's a Ramsar site so why not? Degrowth, that's my favorite. The funny thing is how many of you actually, I mean as I could figure out nobody in this class knew about these work the wetlands but you definitely hear about management of folders. You definitely hear about how to create storm surge barriers, how to manage and make deltas more adaptive. And the crux of my presentation here today is to talk about the fact that these examples of sustainability that exist in our backyards are often forgotten, unacknowledged, because we are looking forward to something else that would come from the West that could help us solve our problems. And that exactly brings me to the concept of cognitive apathy and the man who coined it. And it's important that I talk about him because he needs to be remembered and talked about. One part of that is the person on the screen today, he passed away uh, in 2018, Dr. Drubhajiti Ghosh, who was a United Nations Fellow. He was, like many of you, an engineer, and that to a sanitation engineer, and that to a very hard-nosed one when he started off. And he was working in the State Planning Board, and he asked himself this question, driven by curiosity. What happens to the sewage that's being generated in the city? Nobody seems to know where it's going. So he followed the sewage trail and he found this remarkable waterscape where poor people had used their ingenuity and their creativity to manage and create a waterscape which was actually producing diversity and managing the sewage for the city which he would go on to call an ecological subsidy. He kind of worked out that simply because of this waterscape, the cost of vegetables and fish was 50% lesser than the city of Calcutta than any other metropolitan city in the country. So the question of cognitive apathy is interesting here because I was five kilometers away from the nearest waterscape and I didn't know about it till I was 26 years old and I got into the water sector. This is how it operates. This is how examples which should spur us, which should inspire us, are shielded from us. We don't get to hear or engage with them. 
because even while they're just in our backyard, in my case, it is really my backyard. So what exactly did he mean by cognitive apathy? But for that, we need to know what apathy means. And for those of you who are from Africa, you would be aware of the term very well, especially if you're from South Africa or Namibia. Apathy, which means separateness in Afrikaans, it's a political and cultural construct built on notions of white supremacy and racial superiority, an authoritarian culture that legitimizes and institutionalizes and also legalized racial segregation, a form of superiority based purely on the color of your skin. But Dubert de Gauche coined was cognitive apathy, and I summarize his work here in this, uh, when what's on the screen, a willful segregation of knowledge systems, a systematic exclusion of the knowledge of the poor by the educated elite, an exercise in knowledge supremacy, which delegitimizes knowledge that emerges from quotidian practices involved in living creatively with nature. The argument that was being made was that when poor people innovate and they show that they have remarkable intellectual potential to work with nature, we don't see it as engineering knowledge. The reason why these Calcutta veterans particularly bothered him was because it has existed for so many years, from the 1920s. But it was not acknowledged by the government, it was not acknowledged by anybody else, and it was going on by itself, self-sustained by the community, but the real estate mafia was eyeing it, because it was on the outskirts of Calcutta. And they were slowly creating a system where they were slowly trying to get the land for real estate development. The politics of land and water are inseparable. Often when we look at water, we forget that how intricately it is weaved into the politics of land. And I'll talk about it later in greater detail. And the fact is that these Calcutta wetlands helped him to kind of conceptualize this idea because he could see it with his own eyes what was going on. Because no engineer developed these Calcutta wetlands, then no one would actually recognize this. He spent his entire life's work in getting this ecosystem recognized, getting it a Ramsar designation, which actually kept the, the real estate mafia at bay at a great personal cost. He was chucked out of his job, and I really admire engineers who stick to their curiosity, to their scientific endeavor, and they push back a state which is driven by political economy and not by science. And that is the integrity that Udruvati Ghosh reminds us of when we talk about this case study. And to hear straight from him, this was his definition. He was quite harsh. Uh, and uh, his point was that cognitive apathy is a willful barrier to ecosystem learning and management. It blocks the mind of the learner or implementer to accept lessons free from bias. The victim of the disease thinks in terms of transfer of knowledge in place of exchange of knowledge. These are very powerful words, transfer and exchange. In these words, you'll see how the, the, the manifestations of power that is operating underneath these two words. And a lot of, a lot of many of us who are from the majority world, which is also known as some would call the global south, we know this because a long time, international aid was seen as technology transfer. It was called technical aid. And this kind of lays the foundations as to how knowledge will be perceived and how it will be circulated. Which knowledge circulates, which doesn't is decided by power structures. But before we get into this cognitive apartheid, we need to understand now the, the impact of colonization on all forms of knowledge is quite obvious and it stretches to all kinds of epistemologies and the way we understand and look at the world today. But for the sake of the for this specific lecture, the idea is to focus on water management. And there has been, thankfully, a lot of critical work done into the history of colonial engineering and uh, especially the management of water. And the books that you see on the screen, I'll definitely leave a detailed list of reference with uh, uh, Michelle and uh, Margaret, which can be shared with you later. So, first question that I have for you is, if you're in the 18th century and you're an engineer working on agriculture irrigation, <laughs> Do you really think that there was a degree that you could get, like an institution that was giving out these degrees? Where would you come from? Which institution would you be a part of? Any guesses? If you're an engineer in the 18th century, and I'm talking specifically here about British colonialism, so, any ideas? Well, 
no, I didn't mean that. So what I, okay, I, it's the way I framed the question. What I meant is, yeah, that's you're going really far back in like yeah, by a few hundred more years or you know, a thousand. So uh, the thing what I want to say is that colonial engineering, most of the engineers in the 18th century come to, especially who arrive in India and start working on irrigation management, came from the military. There were no engineering institutions then that was handing out degrees saying this is what you do as engineers. Engineering is something you learned on the job. But the only institution that was producing engineers at that point of time, the 17th and 18th century is basically a history of military exploit, exploits. And engineers was part of that establishment. So the wars have been won, colonies have been built, now people have been conquered, now it's time to conquer the landscape and nature. So, and interestingly, and this is a fascinating book if you get a chance to read it, I've started reading it and it's just amazing how you know engaging it is, Jennifer Durr's book, The Lived Nile. And she makes a very interesting point. She says it is not just the mastery of people, landscape, but also time. When you work on a river where people are using the flood and its seasonality to cultivate and you make it perennial, you change the notion of time in the future. Your cropping patterns change, your agriculture calendar changes, your way of understanding the landscape changes. And this was a very clear colonial project that was happening as well, that was completely restructuring the way we were understanding landscapes or engaging with it. And let us be clear that the roots of water engineering was not this benign thing to save people from floods or to protect people or to, you know, like for, for people in the colonies. It was clearly driven to increase profit from land. The idea was to create infrastructure that would push water back, reclaim floodplains for increasing productivity, which would then translate into rent for the colonial state. And it's important for us to remember that because this is the genesis of, our, of, uh, of water engineering. And because somebody asked the question in the previous session, this is not just specific to water engineering. I'm a geographer. That is very much an imperialist project by itself. Geography and anthropology were equally complicit in trying to unpack the colonies. You, had, you needed to know the terrain and the subjects in order to control them. And so water engineering also is a part of that as well. And that's why we need to be, within the social sciences, we are very reflexive about it. I think water engineering also needs to do the same. Now, what it would do also is to, also to reify the authority of colonial science and engineering. And uh, if you remember the quote by Steve Biko, and uh, I'm assuming that uh, my friends from Africa would kind of know that name uh, quite well, he talked about the fact that the most potent weapon in the hand of the oppressor was the mind of the oppressed. Once you have control of the mind, you can rule any country in the world with a minimum number of people that you need, which was the history of colonization to be very specific. Now, what it also did was to establish expertise and notions of knowledge, which could slowly lead to the decay of alternate forms and of knowing water and worldviews around it. And David Moss's work kind of clearly shows how, with the coming in of colonial engineering, the support and patronage for decentralized water management in southern Indian tanks, especially, started to undergo decay, and the institutional forms that sustained them also did not receive the patronage they received earlier. So uh, this, this was what was happening was the supremacy of one knowledge system taking place while parallelly another knowledge system which was, which was managing these waterscapes were going under DK at the same time. And I don't want to put everything at the foot of colonialism because at no point of time in the majority world where we are always in the land of milk and honey. But the fact is there were of course inequities and there were many serious problems with those systems as well. But interestingly somehow from what the research kind of shows it seemed to have been ecologically quite well fine-tuned. The social complexities are a different story altogether. Now, once you kind of start establishing a particular form of knowledge and you start establishing its uh, primacy over the others, you create benchmarks of what is scientific and modern. And then you create uh, concepts of like what the local people know stops mattering. People who engage with the landscape on a daily basis suddenly stop becoming experts. And Jyoti the coach tractor, he, he was a he, was, he had a certain sense of humor, and he told me once, you know, the funny thing about irrigation engineers, most of the irrigation engineers I know, this is him saying, 
have done the irrigation just by watering the plants in their balcony. <laughs> and this is, if you look at it, of course, I mean, I'm not saying that it's not harsh, but the fact is that a lot of us practice things we don't do. We don't engage with engineering or we don't engage with managing water on a daily basis as much as a woman or a man managing a farm does. And yet our knowledge is somehow so much more important than theirs. And we need to reflect as to why we think like that. So this basically leads to the knowledge which produces experts. And experts lead to the foundations for separation. And I come to one of my own heroes and I hope that if you ever get a chance you'll read his work, Franz Fanon. And Franz Fanon is one of the most well-known post-colonial uh, thinkers on a lot of post-colonial scholarship is based on. And in his book, The Wretched of the Earth, he says the colonial world is a world divided into compartments. In order to reinforce supremacy, in order to tell others that you need to be managed, you need to separate them first. <coughs> you need to create townships in South Africa where people live in tremendous poverty and squalor. And you'll have areas like Camps Bay which consume huge amounts of water, are extremely well managed with the resources from the same country. And you produce those inequitable, uneven landscapes to justify why settler colonialism is acceptable and should be the way it is. So in this world of compartments, how does it play, play out today in today's world? The post-colonial world carries traces of the colonial system in the way it operates. And this especially is in the case of water engineering in India. So when I first, when I heard, uh, are there any people, any friends from Bangladesh here by any chance? Oh, so my, my parents originally were from Bangladesh, so it's always good to see uh, people from Bangladesh have been to the uh, to uh, Bangladesh as well and there's a term that's used in Bangladesh called Nodi Shashun if I'm correct yeah. and the term Nodi Shashun means disciplining rivers now when I first heard this time I was in an utter state of shock because from the school of thought I come from and I come from the Guru Vikosh and Anupam Mishra school of thought where you discipline yourself to live with the river the concept of disciplining a river was quite strange to me and I was trying to understand what was the roots of it. This is not with perhaps my generation, but a lot of engineers who came to study in IIT Delft in the 80s, who were, came from Bue, actually went back and firmly believed in disciplining rivers with embankments and spurs, like almost like a, like a military installation that is trying to prevent the, from the water from coming in. And of course, thinking is changing in the Netherlands and in Bangladesh now, but we live with those legacies. And this, one of these legacies is the story of the embankments in Bihar, which I want to talk about to you today. So, uh, this is a research that we did with an organization called ISIMO, which is based out of Kathmandu, which works uh, a lot on uh, uh, research around transboundary and Himalayan rivers. And we, this is the Gandak River in, uh, in uh, Bihar. And North Bihar is a very interesting place in India. It's a, it's a state in... East, eastern part of India, kind of east, I wouldn't get the specific geography of that because it's part east, part north, but the thing is, uh, it is what Anupam Mishra, a very well-known Indian writer on water used to say, a playground for Himalayan rivers. Almost 54 rivers land on the fertile plains of north uh, Bihar and they, according to him, they used to jump around and play like little children. You could never predict what they were up to. But people knew the rhythm of these rivers. There was an agricultural system that was in tune with that rhythm. And this was one of the most productive agricultural belts in the country. Till the concept of embankments entered the scene. And these statistics, statistics from the government are kind of uh, the way we look at this situation now and we try to explain this but it doesn't tell us the history of how this came about. And the history of this is when the embankments started rolling out, the embankments were built with an explicit agenda, as I kind of discussed earlier, was to increase profit from land revenue. And it was not the colonial engineers alone. That it was actually also in cahoots with the local landlords who realized this was a good way to bring a more private property and take commons under their private control. No, but this is the beauty of embankments, I have to admit, is that it's self-augmenting. You start building on one side, automatically a few years later, somebody will build it on the other side. 
and then you'll start extending it on, on, your, on the left and then someone will start extending on the other side. This is a zero-sum game that we have been playing with rivers for a long time and especially Himalayan rivers because of the ignoring the fact the river water is not just water, it is matter. There are significant amount of silt. In fact, the Kosi and the Brahmaputra, these two rivers in India carry the maximum amount of silt and as a result its course cannot be predicted easily. It shifts continuously. The river Kosi has shifted in the last uh, 75 years almost 160 kilometers. So when you start disciplining this river with embankments, you are going to create a hazard scale. And this is exactly what has happened to the state of Bihar. In 1952, the total length of embankments in the state of Bihar was barely 162 kilometers. Now it is 3,400 kilometers. This is what happens when you, the how colonial engineering infrastructure that ideally should have been critiqued and engaged with differently continues and produces its own political economy and becomes self-sustaining because now money is to be made. There's an Indian journalist called P. Sainath who wrote a brilliant book. If you ever get a chance to read it, called Everybody Loves a Good Drought. And everybody loves a good flood too. Money is to be made in floods. Everybody makes money. People are suffer are the poor. So, the Gandhak River Basin, we went into this and I'll give a specific, uh, and why did we go there to st study what? We wanted to understand how people in this river basin understand floods and predict it using their local knowledge systems. Because this is not an area where your AI and your models and other very cool things apply, where people get to know immediately that there's a flood coming their way. In fact, they're very key information. So the question that we were asking was, how do people know that there's a flood approaching? And this was the research that we were doing in the Nanda River Basin. And what strikes you is that if you see that embankment, that line that's drawn on the map, it divides the landscape and produces two kinds of outcomes. People who stay on the other side of the embankments, who are considered to be safe, but they're not. And then people who are trapped between the river and the embankment, who are very, very vulnerable. And there were different knowledge systems based on which kind of uh, spatial power, which, which space you occupy. And uh, of course, we went on and we did a detailed research. We spoke to a large number of people there. It was a, quite a long study. We wrote a paper and uh, perhaps as a tribute to Rubidity Ghosh, if you have read the IPCC assessment this year and the SROCC report, there is a section on local knowledge. And, also, and uh, local knowledge of floods and, uh, and climate change that has come in. And our paper was cited in there as well, which was kind of the way we need to move ahead as well. But the interesting thing here is that in this landscape are knowledge holders. People with such intimate understanding of this riverscape that would not be the case with the engineers who are actually employed by the government, trained by the finest institutions to manage uh, riverscapes. And I talked to you about, uh, just one example to talk about, is this man called Chandrika Mahato. He is what we call an embankment god or embankment chokidar. He comes from a family of fisher folk, he moved into farming later, but he has amazing uh, knowledge of the river, which was explicit in the way he could predict when a flood was supposed to come. So for example, when we sat down with him and we were talking to him, he talked about how by looking at the drainage channels, which were coming out of the villages and going towards the river, and looking at the color of that water, he would know what was going on. If the color of the water was clear, he knew there was nothing to worry about. But if the color of the water, and as he jokingly said, becomes the color of my skin, <laughs> then he knew there was something wrong because there must have been a breach of the embankment somewhere upstream, and the water carrying mud has entered the natural drainage channels. He also could look at the fish species that came down in the rains, a specific fish called gaiki, which jumps when the water is supposed to overflow the banks. And it jumps because it wants to get into fresh water. And the jumping of the fish is an indication that the river is definitely going to overflow its banks. And if it doesn't jump, it means the river water will tend to, re to recede. Now, the interesting thing about Chandrika Mahato is he is not on the government payrolls. He is paid ad hoc a very nominal amount and there is no permanent job for him. He does it because he got stuck with this job at a time where there was nothing else. And when we went to him, he was like, can you please talk to someone because I haven't been paid for the last six months. 
What allows us to do this to people who actually have knowledge and who are managing a real estate like this? This is what Ruvadi Ghosh meant by cognitive appetite. And we need to be enraged, we need to agitate about this. The way we treat people in our own countries. The way we kind of dehumanize them and strip them of the knowledge they possess. And if you were to talk with him, he would tell you stories that no engineer would tell you. The Louis Gate that he's supposed to manage has a own history of its own. See, the Louis Gates were of course part of colonial engineering and it's supposed to uh, make it more efficient for the drainage to work. But there is politics involved. The farmers upstream want the Swiss lakes to be down so that the water gets impounded which they could use for irrigation later. But as the water builds up, the pressure builds up against the embankment and that could create a flash flood. So it is his responsibility to go and raise the Swiss gates and there has been several times he has been beaten up badly for doing his job. And he also told us, the funny thing is, the Swiss gates are very easy to close but very difficult to pull up and you need to lubricate them properly. But there's corruption there too. The lubricants used are of such bad quality that he needs four members of his family to lift up this fluid gate at a time of need. And these fluid gates need to be operated quickly if, the, if uh, the water builds up. So these kind of knowledge about how it works in, in a landscape like this is embedded in the way he engages with it, but that knowledge is not recognized. So how does one address this? And I go back to uh, Dr. Ghosh's writings. One versus engineers and practitioners, and I know this being a practitioner, if there's two things we do have, is a lot of confidence but also a lot of cynicism. Mm. It comes with uh, working in the sector for a long time. And also the other thing that comes is certainty. And how do you overcome the temptation of certainty? Because engineers in the country I come from India are told that they are at the center of the universe. They are brought up that way, doctors and engineers, they are the ones, they have all the answers. Let us go once just think that we don't have the answers and let's see if we find new answers and new problems in that process. And in order to understand other knowledge systems, we need to inculcate humility within us. It is not just about uh, experts coming from abroad. Are our very own experts uh, humble enough to engage and talk to people and try and understand how things are? Often that's not the case. It is important that we understand lived experience and knowledge produced through labor. It is through labor we work landscapes that on an everyday basis we are learning to observe things that are extremely fine-grained observations which is not possible to get elsewhere. And yet, the way we conceptualize the people working on this landscape has never been positive. We are the same in Bengali and I'm sure my friends from Bangladesh will get this. It's called Chasharmata Buddhi. It's a very pejorative term. It means uh, as intelligent as a farmer, but not in the nice way. So in, if in my school, if I couldn't solve a maths problem, my teacher would say, Amit, you chashramata you do your, your, your intelligence of a farmer. And this is how we normalize the way we dehumanize knowledge holders, in the way we use them in everyday language. And the other important part here is, okay, the other important part here is that we don't need to kind of ditch Western engineering at all. That is not what he would have asked because he was a scientific engineer. He said, recognize the fact that you're working at the interface of bifurcated domains. Be the bridge. Try and engage. There is, let, let's not dominate everything else with the way we've been taught in classrooms. And that's what I think was the key message that he would have kind of wanted to give to everyone. The other was engaging with the social ecological history. Landscapes have such long history. We walk in, we assume that we are working on it. These things have been done for hundreds of years. We need to know what happened before, before we start intervening. But increasingly I'm seeing this in international aid, in uh, the government interventions, we engage as if we were the first to do it and probably the last to do it. Without, without realizing that history is actually laughing at us. And to kind of break it down in the most simplistic uh, way possible, Dhruvati Ghosh said, try and understand what people do and why they do it. Simple words to kind of guide us into how to engage with different forms of knowledge systems. I want to end with two quotes. One is by Mahatma Gandhi, where he writes, uh, Wisdom is no monopoly of one continent or one race. By resistance to, resistance to Western civilization, is really a resistance to its indiscriminate and thoughtless imitation based on assumption that Asiatics are fit only to copy everything that comes from the West. 
And the second is from Franz Fanon. If you want to turn Africa into a new Europe and America into a new Europe, then let us leave the destiny of our country to Europeans. They will know how to do it better than be the most gifted among us. But if we want humanity to advance a step further, if we want to bring it up to a different level that which Europe has shown it, then we must invent and we must make discoveries. Thank you so much for being with me for this session. We have now a few minutes for questions and answers. So who would like to open the floor? Right here. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, my name is Rosa and I'm from South Africa. So I'd first like to point out a few things that have triggered me and then finish off with a question. Um, I did not really know how to term cognitive apartheid. Um, I like that you made it pretty clear what it is and how it separates from apartheid in its own standpoint. Um, and uh, so I liked how you placed it on water because I never thought about it in that sense. I never thought how power could take a resource as important as water out from one um, race just because of the color of your skin. And I could only place cognitive apartheid in terms of how we had a um, road structure, right? So um, I, I recently came from Cape Town, right? So back then in the colonial terms, the main CBD within Cape Town was very structured with the road systems, intersections, everything was healthy. But then walking or driving out from the main city into the townships like Gugule, Tumfuleni, all those only had one road going into the city and one road going out of the city. And you'd wonder why, because most of the hard, lower income um, people came from the townships. So how is it that it was more structured to have a interconnected road planning, but one um, opposite lane type of system out into the townships where you need most of the people? And I like the fact that you made it clear as to why it was as such. Um, so my question is, um, with regards to the case study or the fellow that you had met in that um, town, sh um, town where he had, um, he had the responsibility of maintaining the river and how he had indicators of knowing when a flood was approaching, um, was there an outcome into, let's say, um, establishing a way how you guys could make noise to the government to make them realize that they are knowledge-bound people in the villages in the, in the, in, and in those areas that know what they um, are doing within these areas of responsibilities and giving them a placement in terms of a salary low um, role, more knowledge onto them, or just giving them recognition and just wiping out that con cognitive um, apartheid for them and other villages that had the similar um, problem. Should I answer that? I think just one, yeah, one way. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm uh, glad to know you're from South Africa. I just returned from Cape Town a few uh, weeks ago, and uh, that's why it was very fresh in my mind as well. Uh, that's a very pertinent question. And so, how do you kind of go about making this work? This is definitely hard work, and uh, especially when there's two things happening. One is, of course, the cognitive appetite. People really don't, people in power, people who make decisions on landscapes do not want to acknowledge that there is different forms of knowledge existing there. The other issue is, who do you talk to? Because the problem is that a river scheme is fractured by different forms of governance. Different people making different decisions. And this has been going on for the last two, 300 years. We still haven't managed to solve it. And as a result, it's also difficult to figure out where to place this knowledge system. So we need new structures which kind of work to establish towards establishing alternate knowledge within the decision-making landscape. And uh, so what we did specifically to this research was we wrote about this in different newspapers and we targeted the local Hindi newspapers and the dailies because that is what actually makes a difference. Actually, the problem in India currently is that we assume that a very small minority of people who read English make all the decisions, but that's not the case. The maximum number of people who read uh, newspapers in that part of the country is in Hindi. So that reached Patna, the state capital, 
And uh, the local NGO partners, which is called Make Pine Abhiyan, which is a consortium of NGOs trying to work on managing floods and rivers, uh, they are following it up. But this is going to be a really long struggle. Back in the room, then I'll come to the front. Thank you, sir, for the interesting session. I'm Thomas from India. Um, about the first case study that you told about in Kolkata, I also come from a similar place called Kuchin, uh, down south. Uh, I think so there also like we are dumping all the sewage waste into the wetlands. But the problem like we are exper experiencing, like we have wetlands within the city, so it gets eutrophicated and there are weeds going, like um, growing in these wetlands and it's actually very black in color and the smell is also changing as it goes by. So, um, how uh, effective was that in Kolkata? Like, were the wetlands actually got polluted, or do you have a solution for the pollution that was actually arising because uh, there are actually sewage water and uh, soap water, and everything is going into these wetlands? So, how does the like the fish breeding and did these locals how do they use it for uh, their purposes, domestic purposes like uh, cleaning and drinking water and all? I just wanted to know because I want to implement these things like, if possible. I want to implement this thing back at home because similar kind of solution problem we are facing. That's why. So yeah, thank you so much for the question. I'm glad you asked it because this has been a question that has dogged these calcutta wetlands, and that's one of the biggest reason why people ask this question is because of the conventional way we have looked at sewage as a pollutant. And it kind of, so when we look at sewage, and this is what Dr. Ghosh used to say, the fact that you could use sewage as resource was anathema to a lot of people who came in from the pathogenic angle in terms of, you know, pollution and other things. And the fact that you're eating the fish that is growing in that water, so what kind of contaminants are they carrying back to the city? You'll be amazed to know there were several studies done by the State Pollution Control Board and Jagadpur University, which shows that there was no trace of any pollutant, especially chemical, in the fish that was being consumed. So that's what one. And this was something that Rudolf Ghosh realized. His point was these oxidation ponds. He said, he used to say, give me sunshine and look at how poor people can convert an ecosystem into a healthy one. And the fact is that he, in order to prove that there were no fecal coliform in water on the top layers, which has been exposed to sunlight for a long period of time, took the chief minister to this area, that time his man, the man's name was Jyoti Basu, he took him there and he took a glass and he took up water from one of the ponds and he drank it in front of him. So, you know, what I'm saying is, this is an extreme example, but the fact is, we also need to recalibrate how we understand eutrophication, pollution, other things. For example, the water hyacinth, which is seen as a major problem in our part of the world, in the East Calcutta wetlands, does a phenomenal job of recycling nutrients. So, it's also, we need to kind of start questioning the way we are looking at these wetlands from. If you are looking at it from a conventional perspective of pollutants, pathogens and other notions, then we might find it difficult. Uh, but I would really want you to come to Calcutta. There are some really, really remarkable people working there. Spend some time and see how these people manage this on a day-to-day -day basis. And that will give you amazing clues to take back to Kochi as well. But Amit, uh, I basically, partly because if industrial I want to just yeah, put a, put a yeah, pause yeah, on that for a second. We are going to follow the theme of multiplying voices. Is there anyone who has not asked a question yet who wishes to, to give a comment? Here. Right here. Uh, um, I'm hoping I get to follow your study. I come from North and Kenya where politics of droughts and floods is. We have a lot of NGOs. So people, they get money if there's floods and if there's drought there. So people don't really uh, like solutions. And the, the funny part is they, they play a lot of politics. Politics is the biggest issue. When they come up with ideas, they start from the top. So if the governor and the president get to sign it, there's nothing we can do about it down there. So a lot of times we have people have ideas. Like as I speak to you, my town is flooding. Nine Nine boreholes are down, so there's no water in the town as we speak. A lot of things have been damaged, but people will get excited for a while. Red Cross will come in, Oxfam will come in, UNICEF will come in, so they'll get money. But I've started meetings with high-level people, 
you do try and give solutions, people look at you like you're crazy. So I'd love to, to follow up on your study. Maybe there's a way we can because politics, as I tell you, for me from Africa plays a very huge role. It paralyzes almost everything. So that's that's a good study. I hope we get to learn something from that. Okay, I'm going to go to that side of the room. Actually, I just want to ask about the name of the man that can predict um, about the floods of the Because I want to read about him. Oh, uh, his name is Chandrika Mahato. I'll send the, the paper we wrote uh, across to you. Okay. And uh, the IIT which you, 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 he is mentioned in the paper very clearly. Okay. Okay. I saw you had a slide of references at the so, end, right? Yeah. So that's also maybe the... Uh, yeah. Is it in there, yeah. the paper that you wrote? Yeah. Okay. No, the paper is not here. The paper the is paper not here. <laughs> this is the other literature that I was referring to, yeah. Any more questions in here, comments? Uh, okay, I'm going back over to there. Oh, oh, give her some exercise. <laughs> Okay, we have spoken before. Okay, I'm Chippies from Nepal, and thank you for this very insightful presentation. So, you're talking about the conduct patient there. So I was involved in one of the projects in Gandak Basin by the WWF. We were assessing the ecological flow there uh, in the Gandak Basin within the Nepal. Uh, I would like to add to your thing that, yeah, the local knowledge, that's a very important thing. Uh, in the higher mountains, we don't have really such great problems with flooding with the basin, but in the lowlands in the Tarai, we have a uh, the rivers are such braided that uh, there are many channels, so it's very difficult to train the river. Government has been working, uh, government of Nepal is working for training the river, or is doing the river training works, but each year they build a embankment and the next it's washed out again. So that's the major problem there. But the local people, they build some embankments, they are still sustaining, they sustain for years, rather than the new technologies. So they use uh, some the technologies like wooden embankments, such type of technologies. So that was a great, uh, uh, I would like to say that's uh, very different than what we expect. So uh, as you said, uh, giving credit to the local people, that's very important. Thank you. Just a quick uh, point on that was, you also need to start thinking away from using those terms, training rivers. Yeah. Because those in those words are the germs of the problem. Yeah. Because when you start saying disciplining, training, then you know, you, you basically, a lot of our problems today are solutions of the past. We need to recognize this. For example, the water quality problem in Bangladesh today was a solution to water quality problem in the 1960s and 70s, the tube well. The deep tube well came in because the water from the surface water bodies was said to be so uh, uh, contaminated with uh, bacteria and other forms of and fecal coliform that this was going to give people from Bangladesh and of course the rest of the world, Africa as well, in India as well, safe drinking water. That tube well is now spewing arsenic in Bangladesh where millions of lives are affected. Fluoride in India, you should see what's happening with fluorosis in some of the villages in South India. It's really, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. So that's it. A solution to a problem actually then becomes a problem later. This is, uh, this is something that we as, as water sector professionals need to reflect on. So. Yes. I think I speak for us all in saying that we wish you had more time for <laughs> questions and answers and comments. And I can see this Amitangu, you provoked a lot of curiosity and uh, a lot of people want to continue the debate. So I please take this into the next sessions that we go into. We're now going to take another short break.
Uh, so if you could all be back into the room here, let's say by 11 o'clock, it's about 10 minutes to go to the bathroom and be back. And we're going to watch a documentary movie and then more time for questions. Yes.